Hey, thanks for joining us. If you're new to our online campus, we're really glad you're here. We would love Door Creek Church to feel like home to you. Keep coming back. We are family and growing closer to Jesus together. Last Sunday evening, we got to celebrate 11 people from our church family profess their faith in Jesus through baptism. It was an amazing night. Let's take a look at the highlights from that night as we praise God for the work that he's doing in their lives. Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Baptism was a clear command of Jesus. It's a command that this is what followers of Jesus do. Someone believes in Jesus and then they get baptized. Kirk Beasley. I was in deep bondage to my sin, but Jesus' death has set me free. Now I am justified through faith in him. He is my God and the Savior of my life. So it's a sign that points beyond itself. For everyone who goes down under the water, that's reminding us that Jesus died and went into the grave. And when they come up, it reminds us that Jesus didn't stay in the grave, right? That he was raised on the third day. John hates me. In August of 2003, I accepted Jesus, and since then, God has taught me so much about how to live for him and love and cherish my faith. Sebastian Imacus, I've trusted Jesus a good chunk of my life, and now I'm ready to show the world that I believe him and obey him. So it's pointing to things. It's pointing back to the cross, but it also points back to the day when we first said yes to Jesus. Joshua Keller. Evan Keller. Carianna Keller. Jason Keller. So everybody who's getting baptized tonight knows Jesus as their personal savior. They put their faith in Christ. Not in good works, but in Jesus' good work on the cross. Ore Afalabi. Tyler Niermeyer. Evie Heitzman. So I was baptized as a baby, but now I understand that Jesus died for me. Melissa Heitzman. I've been a Christian my whole life, but now I truly understand what Christ did for me. It reminds us of our calling, right? To die to ourselves and live for God and to live for others. And it reminds us also, it teaches us that we're part of the family of God together. Wow, God is at work, and we are just so grateful to him for all he is doing in the lives of people here at Door Creek Church. Now let's join our worship team as we sing our praises to our amazing God. Well, hey, good morning. Welcome to Door Creek Church. Would you stand and join us? We're gonna sing a couple of songs together this morning.
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you None beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
God holds our every breath. Those are powerful words that we just sang. If we believe he holds our every breath, we will be filled with his love, allowing us to love others more abundantly and give more generously. John 13, 34, 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Jesus is all about love, and we should be the same. And now we're going to hear from Ella and Anya, two of our amazing interns, as they share what God is doing in and through Door Creek Church. Welcome, everyone. I'm Ella. And I'm Anya. And, and we're, we're interns here at Door Creek, Creek Church. Church. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. God is working in big ways here at Door Creek Church. So make sure to check out our online bulletin at doorcreek.info. In the bulletin, you'll find a way to connect with us, give online, and see what's coming up at Door Creek Church. If you're a new follower of Christ, visit the Next Steps tab to let us know that you said yes to follow Jesus. In this tab, you'll find information on our next baptism event, life groups, ways to get involved, as well as resources to help you connect with ministries and continue you in your spiritual growth. Let's take a look at a few things happening right now. As part of this year's school supply drive, Door Creek Church has the opportunity to gather school supplies for our local school partners in Madison, Sun Prairie, and Forest. On Sunday, August 8th and August 15th from 8 a.m. to noon, please consider donating school supplies to distribute to families who are under-resourced and assist teachers in meeting their students' needs. Visit our website for a full list of school supplies. We also have registries set up at Target and Amazon to make gathering these supplies easy and convenient. Volunteers are needed on August 17th to help sort out all the donations. Check out our online bulletin for signing up. Door Creek's vision is to equip interns and residents with an opportunity to grow in their God-given gifts, passions, and character through participation in our church and mission. This summer, I was given the opportunity to intern in children's ministry. I loved getting to know the families and interacting with all of the kids. Over the past six months, I have been the student ministries intern here at Door Creek Church. I've been given the opportunity to teach, lead small groups, play games, hang out with the students, and I have loved every single second of it. To learn more or to receive application material for the fall and next ministry year, fill out the form on the Connect tab found in the digital bulletin and type Internship. The staff will follow up with you right away. Upward Flag Football is back and evals are coming up. This program is for boys and girls kindergarten through fifth grade. Each child learns new skills and is affirmed and encouraged throughout. All participants are required to register and attend evaluation on August 10th with practice starting at the end of August. Learn more or register on our online bulletin, doorcreek.info. Now, let's open the scriptures together as we continue in our summer series, Watchdogs, the Minor Prophets. Welcome again to Door Creek. Hey guys, it's been a great week in the life of our church. We had 12 from our church family that got baptized last Sunday night. And we celebrated with just lots of shouting and cheering over at the Monona Pool. And I know you would have loved to have been there with us, but thanks for your commitment in this place, your prayers, your service, your just generous giving. Speaking of that, um, we're coming to the end of our ministry here. We got about four weeks left this week and three more. And uh, then it's the end of the ministry year. And you know we had a big challenge. I said at the beginning of the summer, we need four months of giving in three months time. And there's been an outpouring of generosity. Thank you, thank you, thank you in the months of June and July. And now we need to finish strong. We need about 325 more to hit our projected expenses. That's 325,000. So if you haven't yet participated in what God's doing in and through this place, man, we invite you to join us an easy, safe, secure way to give is just go online and you can hit that give tab. Or just if you're one of our campuses, you can give in one of the offering boxes as well. And for those of you who regularly give and have been, thank you. Thanks for your generosity. And just a challenge that in this month, this is a great time to give that extra gift to help us get over the hump. So we're well positioned to see more and more people become devoted followers of Christ. 
All right, let's get into the watchdogs, the minor prophets. So we're to reminder, because we're going through these individual books, like there's 12 of them, we're going through 11. And so it's easy to kind of think of each one of its separate book, but it's good to remember that actually they were stitched together into one scroll. It was called the book of 12. And so we shouldn't be surprised to see themes moving throughout these books. We shouldn't be surprised that there's some, some method to the madness of how they're arranged. For example, as we come to the book of Nahum, which is a prophecy against Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, the ruling empire of the day, the, the very people that had dragged off the northern kingdom in 721 under Sennacherib into exile. They were vicious. They were cruel. We're going to talk about it. That the Ninevites that are spoken against in Nahum's prophecy actually show up in Jonah's. But in Jonah... God moves to these wicked, violent people with a message of mercy through a warning like, guys, you better get your act together or I'm going to take it all down. And they responded to it. And that's, you know, Jonah didn't want to go there because he hated those people. And when they repented, he reminded God why he didn't want to go there in chapter four, verse two. I knew you were gracious and compassionate God. Slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So God's mercy to his enemies. Micah is God's mercy to his unfaithful people. A God who delights in showing mercy to unfaithful people who have built high places and they got crazy syncretism in their religion, right? The idolatry and they're not loving, they're trashing their own neighbors. And so there's this theme of God's mercy, but there's also these themes of judgment. And so we come to, to Nahum, and the question that could be very likely in the people of God at this time is, well, what are you gonna, we understand what you're gonna do to us, and we deserve it, we get it, we know the consequences of our sin, and we're grateful that you had a message of hope for us and that there's mercy for us, but we wanna know about this conqueror that you're gonna bring in, even the Assyrians, what are you gonna do with them? And Nahum, whose name means comfort, brings this comforting message that says, here's where we can find comfort when you face evil. So what a great word for the people back then. What a great word for us today. As we see evil around the world, as we see evil in our own backyard, so to speak, and sometimes in our own very hearts. Nahum proves so helpful. And so look at the evil that was known in his day about Nineveh. And I'm just referencing you to chapter three, verses one through five. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. So the blood here is about the violence that they're committing. And just listen to the staccato of what they were on about. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears. Many casualties piles of dead bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute, prostitute alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and people by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, was a violent, violent city full of lies and deceit and plunder, full of victims. It was a brutal empire and it was vast. It was the empire of the day and it spread around the known world. And when he describes it as a city of blood, a violent city, trust me, that was an understatement. In fact, the rulers of Assyria, some of the generals, they carved in stone to be recorded for all time because you can go to the British Museum in London and you can look at it. Etched in stone would be the records of their atrocities. These are the kinds of things that rulers today would hide and cover. They wouldn't want anybody to know. They bragged about it. So we read 
things like this. And I quote one of the rulers, Edston Stone, at one of the stone memorials. I flayed all the chief men who had revolted and I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I walled up within the pillar, some impaled upon the pillar on stakes and in others I bound their skin upon the wall and I cut off the limb of the officers of the royal officers who had rebelled. Another one, 3,000 of their warriors I put to the sword. Many captives from among them I burned with fire. From some I cut off their hands and their fingers and from others I cut off their noses and their ears and their fingers. And many I put out the eyes. I made pillar of the living and another of heads. I bound their heads to posts around the city, Nineveh. As they captured these rulers, they tied them up like like dogs to chains and had them living in, in kennels. The good ones got lucky and they had hard labor working to build their monuments and their castles. It was the center of evil, Assyria, Nineveh, their capital. A capital of crushing tyranny, the epitome of cruelest torture. And it wasn't unknown to the people of Naaman's day because they had a front seat to it. So Naaman's writing in the middle of the 7th century, 650-ish, we don't know exactly. So what we do know, though, is in 721 some BC, some 70 or so years before that, Sennacherib, the, the Assyrian leader, came in and sacked the northern 10 tribes, their brothers and sisters, and carried them off into exile. They knew about the heinous things that the Assyrians had been doing. It was known around the world of their evil and their atrocities. So Nahum comes on the scene to give perspective, his name comfort, to bring comfort to God's people who are facing great evil. And maybe, just maybe, that's a good word for you today as you're dealing with the very same thing. So Nahum chapter 1. If you're not a Nahum yet, you're probably not going to find it. It's just a couple pages in the back of the Old Testament. So grab your table of contents, find it. Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. So there we go. Jonah chapter 1. When we face great evil, find comfort, first off, in his character. Notice how Nahum starts his prophecy. Verse 1, a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. He's from Elkish. Nobody knows where Elkish is, but we know that's where he's from. So here's, here's his prophecy. And it begins with God's character, right? The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Can you imagine? Bashan and Carmel, these just verdant places up in the north, wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence. The world and all who live in it, who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good. A refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood... He will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes, his enemies, into the realm of darkness, an image of hell itself. So when we face great evil, find comfort, Nahum says, in God's character. So the easy thing to focus on is the evil and the offense and the fear. And he says, turn your eyes to God. Remember who God is. That he's a jealous God. And we're going, whoa, whoa wait a minute. That's not a good thing, is it? Jealousy? Well, in God's perfect love, which this is attached to, it's a beautiful thing. God is love and commitment and desire to protect us and to care for us. 
It talks about his care for his own glory and honor as the supreme God of all gods. Remember that he loves you. He has a jealous love for you, a protective love for you. Remember too that he's a God of vengeance and he's filled with wrath and that wrath is gonna be poured out on those who do evil. This is an extension of his holiness, an extension of his justice that he will deal with all that is wrong and make it right, that he will bring every injustice to bear. He will not leave the guilty unpunished. Verse three, he's slow to anger, but great in power. He will not leave the guilty unpunished. Verse eight, with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end to Nineveh. He will pursue his foe into hell itself. So chapter three, verse one, woe to the city of blood. Verse 15 of chapter one, no more will the, inv- will the wicked invade you, Nineveh. Nope, they will be completely destroyed. You'll be completely destroyed, completely destroyed. So what do we learn about God's confrontation of evil? He'll do it with great power. We're gonna look at that in just a second. And in his timing, because he's slow to anger, so we're going to understand that God is patient. And his patience is, is in play, but it's not to be confused with. He will deal with it in his own time. With great power in his timing, he's going to unleash his holy anger, his wrath against all evil, completely destroying it, dealing with it. And as is the case of Assyria, he's going to give the evildoer very likely a dose of their own medicine. So the very things that they were perpetrating against other people are the things that would be done against them. Great evil. When the Babylonians in 612 came in and took over and overthrew the Assyrians. He cares about his people. Remember that when you find comfort in his character. He cares about evil and wickedness and injustice and he's going to deal with that. Second part of his character is he's patient though. He's slow to anger. Great in power. That gives us a great perspective because it means that God will not necessarily deal with the injustice today and that's where we're stuck. And that's where our feelings are saying, obviously, you don't care. And God's character is saying, absolutely, I care. I'm jealous for you. And I know what has happened. And I am going to bring it to justice. Trust me. And remember that I'm slow to anger. And I'm abounding in love. I'm full of compassion and grace. But I will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So God is slow to anger. No better example than God's response to Nineveh, slow to anger when they deserved his wrath. Peter would say this about about God's patience. So there's one of the disciples, one of Jesus' closest disciples. The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So this God who's filled with wrath is, is a God who is patient, slow to anger not wanting any to perish, but everyone to turn back to him. That's 2 Peter 2, verse 9. Actually, I think it might be chapter 3, verse 9. Little typo there. Slow to anger. Slow to anger. But his patience should never be confused with his lack of power. Oh, well, the reason God's not dealing with it is he's, he's not able to. No, 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 no. He's patient wanting even the evildoer to come to repentance. He has great power. It's power like a tornado, like a hurricane. He is, he is an awesome God. His feet ride the clouds, which are like dust under his feet. So great is our God. He could utter a word and empty the, the oceans and the rivers. The mountains quake, the hills melt, the whole earth trembles in the presence of almighty creator God. And because God is great in power, there is no evil that he doesn't see and know about. And there is no evil that he will not deal with. The abuse that you've endured, emotional, physical, sexual, I was doing this sermon and all of a sudden my phone started going crazy and it was an Amber Alert. 
2002, Toyota Camry, someone's abducted somebody, a child likely. There is no kidnapping, no abduction. There's no embezzlement or financial misdealing that you're suffering that he doesn't know about. There's no slanderous attack on you that he doesn't know about and care about. There's no violence that you've undergone or someone close to you has undergone that has escaped God's notice, your betrayal, the injustices that you suffered. But perhaps today you feel like God has forgotten the evil that you're suffering or that you suffered. Maybe like Asaph in Psalm 73, you feel like the bad guys are winning, that they're prospering. Remember his character. God is loving, he's just, he's patient and great in power. So find comfort in his perfect character. And there's a second thing. He tells us where we can find comfort and that is in his promise. In chapter one, verse 12, he says, this is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, speaking of Nineveh, they'll be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, people of God, the people of, of Nahum's day, I will afflict you no more. His promise that he will deal with evil and that he is gonna rescue us one day from all affliction. And then the beautiful promise that comes in verse seven. Verse seven says, the Lord is good. This too is part of his character. In fact, if you take all of the qualities and attributes of God's character, it could all be summed up in he's good. He's good. His love is good. His justice is good. His mercy is good. All of God's attributes could be wound up in that word. He is good. The Lord is good. A refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. That's the promise. That's the promise that his goodness and mercy will never end and that he will care for those who trust in him. We can bank on that promise. We can bank on it. He's our protection. He's our protection, our refuge in times of trouble. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in a day of trouble, Psalm 46, one. He doesn't say God is our refuge and strength and he will get us out of all trouble so that we never encounter trouble. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life will, not might, suffer persecution. So then the question is, so what does it look like to trust in God when facing evil? What does it look like to find comfort as we remember his promises? It's to trust. And trust looks like, We'll go to God for refuge and protection. So a refuge should get us to almost a physical option, a lot, object like a shelter. You run into this place. Like when you're in a storm and there's lightning all around, you want to get to a safe place. God is that safe place. When all you know what is breaking out and all evil is breaking out, we got to run back to God, his character, his promises, his provision. So take refuge in God. The psalmist says in Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. Cease striving, literally put your hands down. Psalm 46, 10, just trust that I've got you, that I know what's going on, that I love you and that I have great power, greater than anything you're facing right now. Remember his character. Cling to his promises. Take God at his word. Hey, you're going to trust? He says he cares for those who trust. What does trust look like? Well, trust is, is another word for faith in the Bible. And faith is all about taking God at his word. That's Abraham. He obeyed his commands. God said, Abraham, I need you to go. Leave your people. Leave your comfort zone. I need you to go. I need you to leave behind your people, your customs, your gods. I need you to go follow me. And then you need to believe the promises. And he did that. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned unto him, credited unto him as righteousness. He believed 
the promises. He obeyed the commands. And if we don't know God's word, we'll never know his character. We'll never be able to trust in him because we won't know what to obey, what to follow, and we won't know what to believe in when it comes to his promises. Speaking of promises... All the promises that God makes, the Bible tells us, are fulfilled in Christ. In fact, Nahum gives us an allusion to Christ right here in chapter 1, verse 15. Look at verse 15. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. So take refuge in God. His character Take refuge in God. His promises, take refuge in God. His Savior, the promised Messiah, the King, the one there on the mountains whose feet brings good news, who proclaims peace. Now, remember what I said about the prophets and these themes and ideas and motifs running through it? This should be ringing in our ears because Isaiah talks about the son who would be born in chapter nine, verse six of this virgin, right? And, and this son would have the government on his shoulders and yeah, he'd be a wonderful counselor and he'd be mighty God, but he'd also not only be the everlasting father, he would be the prince of peace, chapter nine, verse six. In chapter 53 of Isaiah's prophecy, he talks about this same coming savior who's described as this suffering savior, not this conquering king. He's a suffering servant. And he says this about the suffering servant, but he was pierced for our transgression. Speaking in the past tense about that, which will certainly happen in the future concerning Christ. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. Last week in Micah, chapter 5, 2, the Christmas verse, right? Oh, Bethlehem, right? You are small of the clans. You know, out of you will come this great ruler. And he will stand and shepherd his flock, verse 4 says, in the strength and majesty of the name of the Lord. And they will live securely, God's people, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And this one, this shepherd, even the one born in Bethlehem, he will be our peace. Take refuge in Christ, the Prince of Peace, the one who makes peace with God possible, the one who gives us the peace of God that passes human understanding. Take refuge in his character. Take refuge in his promises. Take refuge in his promised son, Jesus Christ. And believe the good news that he came and preached. Mark chapter 1, 14 said, Jesus came preaching the good news of the kingdom and he called people to believe it and to align their lives to it, to repent, to turn back to God, to believe the good news that God so loved the world, you and me, so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, John 3, 16. So Jesus is the promised savior who brought the good news of God's love for us and Jesus in bringing the good news suffered great evil. He suffered abuse, emotional abuse at the hands of his enemies, even his followers, physically tortured by his enemies, injustice of the worst kind, an innocent man condemned to die, the brutal death of Roman crucifixion, and worse, he bore the whole world's sin, past, present, and future. When the darkness hovered over the cross, it's because Jesus had the weight of our sin, all of it on him. He experienced the evil of betrayal by one of his closest inner circle disciples. He experienced embezzlement by a close friend. Maybe you too. He experienced violence, beaten 39 times, murdered by asphyxiation. The feet that came to this earth to bring good news walked and made a beeline to to Jerusalem where he knew he'd be handed over to his death. It was those feet that didn't just bear the good news, it bore the cross. It was those feet that were nailed to the cross for you and me. Jesus has ascended into heaven, but through his death and resurrection, he gave victory to all, over all evil, 
over sin, over death, over the devil. And one day he will come back as the rightful judge over all things. And he will right all wrong and restore everything to their rightful place, everything and anything, as he brings heaven to earth, a place where there's no more evil in this world. No more evil, praise God, in our hearts. So a couple questions as we wrap it up. First, are you suffering and troubled over some evil right now? Nahum says, you know what to do. Find comfort in God's character. Find comfort in God's promise. Even his promised son, Jesus Christ. Find comfort, find comfort. Find comfort in the fact that God in his grace frees us from the things that can be destroy us. And that is revenge and retaliation. And because he's going to deal with evil, we don't have to. Because he's going to deal with evil, we can say like Joseph, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Genesis 50, 20. He's saying this to his brothers who sold him as, like a piece of meat to the Ishmaelites going down to Egypt as a slave. You meant it for evil. He didn't bat an eye about calling sin, sin. But God meant it for good so that he would use me to save many people. But maybe for you right now, you're not just troubled with God's inattention to your suffering. You're actually troubled with the fact that how could I ever follow and love and, and give my life to a God who's allowed such evil in my life? And all I can say, the Bible's really clear when it gets to the whole issue of evil. It all chases back to pride, pride in that fallen angel, the devil. Pride in Adam and Eve and all of their kids, you and me, since then. That's where it all goes back to. And what you got to remember, if you're struggling with how could God allow this, that God is committed to doing something about evil, your evil, to the point where he allowed his son to suffer evil so that you could one day live in a world that is free from evil so that you could know that all the evils of this world were brought to justice. Would you take refuge, those of you who are suffering, maybe for the first time in God's son, Jesus Christ? The second question is, are you guilty of doing evil right now? Have you been guilty of doing evil right now? And it plagues you. Receive the good news and stop believing the lie that God could never forget, forgive me for the great evil I've done. That is to belittle Christ in his work on the cross. Christ's work on the cross is sufficient for all sin, all evil, all wickedness, all of it combined, let alone yours. There's nothing you've done. There's nothing you could do that could separate you from the love of God. But let me just say this for those of you who aren't ready to turn back. Don't confuse your success right now in doing evil. Don't confuse it with God doesn't know what's going on, that your sin is hidden from God. He sees it completely. God is slow to anger. And do not test his anger. You do not know what tomorrow holds. It is appointed for man once to die and after that, the judgment. And so confess it, own it. Ask God to forgive you. Put your faith in Christ whose punishment brings us peace with God. Let's pray. For those of you listening at our campuses today, I'm gonna to invite you after the service to meet up front with your campus pastor. For those of you watching online to contact us so that we could pray with you as well. Perhaps you're going through some great suffering over evil right now. Perhaps you're suffering over your own guilt. And we'd love to pray with you. Father God, hear the cries of our heart as we wrestle with this whole matter of trusting you. 
Simple words, so hard to do. Strengthen us, Jesus, with your spirit so that we, like you, could trust your Father, our good God, who loves us, who is committed to deal with all injustice, who is good and all-powerful for all, all that is before us. Grant faith, grant humility, sober us up, Lord, to the fact that the earth trembles in your presence. That the clouds are the dust of your feet. Humble us, Lord, as we cry to you for mercy. And Lord, free us up to do good, to not be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good, even as your word commands. Until you come or call us home, this is our prayer. In Christ's name, who makes that possible, God's people said, amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Your message has challenged us in a beautiful way. Hey, online campus, our students need you. You can love students in our partner schools by donating school supplies. We have made it easy to donate without leaving your home by using either the Target Registry or Amazon wish list. Thank you for loving our students in schools. We love you and can't wait to see you next week.